Hello, welcome back to my series on post-colonial concepts. Today I'll be talking about mimicry, which to me personally is one, one of the hardest uh, post-colonial concepts to explain. And today I'll be relying on, in the beginning, on Amardeep Singh's discussion of the concepts, uh, and it's on his website. And also I use it uh, in the glossary on my own website, and I'll post a link in the description below for you to follow. But the reason I like Amardeep Singh's discussion of it is because he offers an explanation of the term in very simple words, something that you, me, and many others can easily understand. And according to him, uh, mimicry is traditionally seen as something shameful. So before I go into his definition or discussion of it, I mean, technically by mimicry, what we usually mean is when someone mimics someone's actions, right? And uh, so if you look at human development, our early learning is slightly mimetic as children because we internalize how to do things by observing and then maybe unconsciously internalizing the behaviors of others. But mimicry traditionally also involves, it has a slight element of satire or making fun of others, right? But in uh, post-colonial cultures, being a mimic man or mimicking is traditionally considered something shameful. Right, and this is where Amardeep Singh comes in because what he's saying is that most of the times in post-colonial cultures, looking at their colonial history, we use it as a derisive term, right? For about people who maybe mimic the habits of the colonizers, try to be more English than the Englishmen themselves. We have a lot of derogatory terms for, for these people. Some of them were called coconuts, right? Brown outside, white inside. And there are other terms that people have traditionally used for people who mimic or mimicked uh, dominantly European or British identity. Now, uh, so, I mean, if we went by this traditional or not traditional, but Amardeep Singh's reading of it, then mimicry by itself would be a totally negative habit or negative practice to follow, right? But if you've read Homi Baba, and there is a link to uh, his uh, famous chapter on mimicry uh, in the description, you know that he uh, kind of positions the concept as a menacing concept. And there is a reason for that, because mimicry, according to Baba, was perpetuated through colonial policy, and there are colonial documents on it, right? So the, if you look at Lord Macaulay's famous minute, the idea was to create mimic men. Right, and Baba gives us the lineage of Macaulay's minute, uh, also, which you can uh, read, and uh, the link is in the description. So the idea was how to create Indian subjects who mimic the habits, aesthetics, and maybe the politics of their masters, but only mimic that, right? And don't become thinking subjects in themselves. So hence Macaulay's famous minute on Indian education, where the purpose of the education, the English education, was not necessarily to create critically conscious thinking beings, but to create people who, in Macaulay's words, could become interpreters between the masters and their Indian native you know, servants or colonized people. And that kind of education then was meant to create uncritical people who would, in one way or the other, idealize the language, its vocabularies, and abilities in that language, and would see it as a mark of their being, you know, progressive or being advanced in opposition to their own native.
counterparts. So that kind of mimicry then created a human subject which could be English in performance, but not necessarily have the same rights and privileges that the actual Englishman had, right? Now, Baba suggests that that mimicry that the native performs, it's neither this nor that. You don't become an Englishman, of course, but you can perform a sort of English sensitivity. So that aspect of his not being the whole thing, not being this or that somewhere in between is where Baba sees the promise of mimicry itself because it, it destabilizes the colonial imperative. It performs the identity that the colonizers wanted to produce of a native subject who has internalized certain imperatives of colonial masters, but doesn't necessarily think of him or herself as their equal, right? But then the same people also, when they are performing that identity, also pose a threat to the system because what if they could step across? And that's exactly what happens in India, for example. Uh, most of the leaders uh, come from the elite group, at least those who involved in the uh, later freedom struggle, and they use their mimicking abilities of learning the master's vocabularies and then menace the discourse of colonialism by posing a challenge, right? So in that sense, mimicry no longer remains a purely negative trait. It becomes sort of a revolutionary trait. And that is what Baba, through, of course, a very complex discussion, is trying to retrieve from his reading of colonial documents and the native behaviors and politics. And of course, you can follow it uh, through the links and read for your own and make up your own mind. But in post-colonial theory, then uh, mimicry has different connotations. One is understanding that maybe someone is using the term mimicry or mimic man to criticize you know, some other colonial subjects for their Eurocentric performative identities and behaviors. And if you look around yourself, if you live in India, Pakistan, Sri Lanka, or any other African or Caribbean colonial spaces, you already know that people do make fun of people who might want to speak in a British accent or in the purely American accent. And you, we do think that that is kind of a mimicking performance. But as far as my knowledge of Pakistan is concerned in certain class uh, segments, having the ability to speak in the Queen's English or whatever you want to call it is considered uh, a huge uh, positive and people do aspire to it. But if you look at that conflict, see who would criticize these people, it would sometimes be class-based, right? So overall, uh, to conclude, you know, literally mimicking means when we mimetically try to perform our own actions like someone else, right? Traditionally, to mimic is considered uh, a negative practice. We do that when we are trying to make fun of someone else. It also involves some kind of uncritical repetition of someone else's actions. Um, or um, so that is also a negative connotation. But in terms of Baba's explanation of it, it also has a positive connotation. And if you look at the ironic and political and parodic works of later post-colonial authors like Salman Rushdie, Hanif Qureshi, and all the others, you see that the, what they do with language, right? It mimics English language, but then they disrupt it, right? And they insert terms in it which cannot really be understood by a purely Eurocentric audience. So that is this person mimicking the language, its genres, its forms, but then menacing it with something which would only be understood by someone who has a knowledge of both this and that, right? Something in between and something not that or this. I mean, that's Homi Baba. 
So this, these are some of my uh, thoughts about mimicry. I'm grateful to Amardeep Singh for simplifying the term for so many of us. And uh, the link to his discussion of the term is in the description. And then if you want to do further reading on it, the links to Homi Baba's uh, brilliant chapter on the concept of mimicry is also available. And I hope this has helped you a bit. And if you have any more questions, you know, as always, please feel free to post them in the comments. And if you like what I do uh, on this channel, please do subscribe it. I'll be really grateful for that. So thank you so much. And I will see you next time.